Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple of years ago, several years ago now, I, um, I, I did something that wasn't all that intelligent, and, and I lifted too much weight in the wrong way, and I dislocated my shoulder. And I didn't need anyone to tell me that there was a problem, because I went to the doctor, and they reset my shoulder, and I thought everything was okay, but I had persistent shoulder problems after that. I couldn't move it a certain way. It would hurt to just throw the covers up on the bed, so I just quit making the bed. That's a good excuse. Anybody who wants to get out of making bed, just say you got shoulder problems. So I scheduled a doctor's appointment, and, and the doctor did an MRI of my shoulder, and the MRI didn't hurt, but it revealed the cause of the hurt. The MRI was able to see inside that I had a torn labrum, actually, in both shoulders. I had a cracked clavicle, and I had a slightly, dis, uh, a slightly torn rotator cuff in my right shoulder. The MRI itself wasn't the problem, but it revealed what the problem was. Today, we're going to take a look at the book of James, and when we look at the book of James, our goal is to use the book of James, kind of like that x-ray or MRI of my shoulder, and let it look inside of your life and mine, into our hearts and into our lives, and to see exactly what the problem is. James is not going to cause a problem. James is not going to hurt you, but James is going to reveal what may be lurking beneath the surface. So if the words from James offend you, if they hurt you, if they anger you, please take those up with the author of Scripture. That would be God himself. I'm just telling you what James is saying. So a couple of operating principles before we get started. The first operating principle is you are not the center of the universe. I know that that may be hard for some of us to hear because we want life to be about us. I mean, after all, you want people to wait on you hand and foot. You want people to serve you. You want people to do what you want. But there is a ridiculous amount of pressure when you have it all about you. Because if you are the one in control, and if, if everybody is there to serve you, then, then you have to make sure that you are constantly on. You have to ha look the right way and speak the right way, act the right way, face the right direction, have the right intonation in your voice, never yell, always keep your voice in the right tone. You have to do all the right things. You have to make sure there's nothing stuck in your teeth when you're in front of people. When it's all about you, you have to make sure that you are right. So operating principle number one, the center of the universe is not you, rather, the center of the universe, this is the interactive part, the center of the universe is God. Jesus is the Son of God, yes, God, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, God is the center of our universe. He is the, the uppermost part of all that we do. Operating principle number one. Operating principle number two, as the center of the universe, God knows more than you. Anybody agree that God knows more than them? Great, awesome. So, so God knows more than you, which means the things that happen may not happen the way you want them to, but rather they are put together in such a way that if you follow the directions and the guidelines that God gives you, your life will have a uniquely different outcome than if you ran it yourself. Those are our two presuppositions. One, God is God and you are not. Two, God knows more than you and his way is better than your way. Those are our two operating principles for today. Now, to get, to get ourselves started this morning, I want to take a look at, at the book of James. And as we look at the book of James, James is this very practical, very down-to-earth book that explains to us how to live our lives as Christians. James chapter 3, especially beginning in verse 13, which was our second reading for this morning, is where we're going to camp out most of our time together. James chapter 3 talks about wisdom. What is wisdom? Maddie gave us a definition of wisdom. It's, it's not only knowing the right thing, but, but taking what you know and putting it into practice. And so in that definition, wisdom is knowing that my brakes will stop my car, not knowledge, wisdom is pushing the brake when someone in front of me slows down. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. The Bible has a little bit different of a definition. The Bible's definition in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says that the beginning of all wisdom is the fear and love of the Lord. 
Our world has many different definitions of wisdom. Our world will define wisdom as applying knowledge, uh, as acquiring knowledge, as obtaining certain levels of proficiency within our world. But, but the scriptures tell us that the starting point, the basis, the foundation of, not, of wisdom is the fear and love of the Lord. So using that as, as kind of the starting point, if, if we're going to be running a race uh, or, or, or we're going to be uh, going from, from our, our first down marker uh, off to find out where the next first down is if you're one of those football people. So there's the, the line of scrimmage and we're standing there. The line of scrimmage is the fear and love of the Lord. This is where we start. We place the ball firmly on this line of scrimmage. The fear and love of the Lord, that is where we start. And as we begin our, our journey in Christ with the ball firmly placed on that being our starting point, the fear and love of the Lord, we can find a good judge, a good basis for how we go about living our lives in this state of wisdom. There's another chapter in the book of Proverbs that if you were to give chapters of the Bible titles, like 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 15 is the resurrection chapter, Proverbs chapter 8 is the wisdom chapter. As a matter of fact, Proverbs chapter 8 is all about uh, speaking it from wisdom's perspective. I, I highly encourage you to read Proverbs 8 sometime. It's a really cool uh, chapter in the book of Proverbs. It's wisdom speaking to you. Uh, little uh, side note, a little bit of a clue into things. Wisdom is Jesus. And so Jesus is the one speaking in Proverbs chapter 8 as if he is wisdom itself, because he is. The fear and love of the Lord is Jesus. Jesus is the perfect illustration, the perfect depiction of the fear and love of the Lord. I mean, after all, he willingly laid his life down for you and me because his father asked him to do so, fear and love of the Lord. Now, a few things we have to get under our belts before we get too far into this. Uh, James is going to talk about what it looks like to be wise and what it looks like to be not wise. In the eyes of the world, not wise is also known as foolish. And so he's going to draw this great polarization, this great dichotomy between wisdom and foolishness. And James is going to tell us exactly what foolishness looks like and then what it leads to ultimately. So let's take a look first and foremost at James chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. This is great. Who is wise and understanding among you? Has anybody, have you ever had one of those times when somebody asks you a question that they did not expect an answer to? I'm pretty sure James was asking that question. When James is writing this letter, he's not sitting there waiting for all the first grade little boys in the room to go, ooh, 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 me, 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 I'm wise. I'm pretty sure he's writing this saying, I hope nobody answers. Who is wise and understanding among you? Expecting no answer, he continues. If you think that you are wise, if you believe in your heart of hearts that you are wise, by his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. You see, one of, the, one of the downfalls of when we think that we are wise, when we claim wisdom of our own, we have already automatically done one thing wrong, and we have broken our first presupposition. If you, by virtue of your ultimate wisdom, say, yes, 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 James, James, I, I am wise. We have broken our first rule. Our first rule was that you are not the center of the universe, rather God is. You are not wise. You are made in the image of wisdom, but you are a broken version of wisdom. So am I. I'm not putting you down. I'm actually putting myself there before you. You see, the problem happens when, when we think too highly of ourselves, when, when we start to put ourselves in the place of wisdom, when we start to claim something of our own that is not ours to claim. We replace God with ourselves. And if I can get real with you for just a minute, I think many of us as, as Christians in the world today have made ourselves our own God. Now, we would never admit that. We would never say, yes, yes, I think I'm God, because that's just arrogant. But you know what? The way we live our lives, the way we act, the way we pray, the way we speak, 
oftentimes gives people the impression that we think we are God. I mean, how many of our prayers, if we really listen closely and if we really boil things down to the, to the heart of the matter, how many of our prayers are prayed with the idea that God should really be serving me? I think all too often in my own life, my prayers put God having me as the center of his universe instead of him being the center of mine. James continues, who is wise, who has wis, who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works and meekness of wisdom. Now he's going to go on now and he's going to talk about what happens and what it looks like when you don't have wisdom. And so, so this is the place where you and I probably ought to like, listen a little bit more closely. We turn, turn, our, turn our ears on a little bit more so we can pay attention to the words he says because these are the cautions, these are the caution moments that you and I probably need to see and to hear because if these things in any way, shape, or form are present in our lives, we are bordering down the line of ungodly wisdom. But if you, verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. If you have bitter jealousy or selfish ambition, do not boast that you have wisdom. You see, two things that indicate that we don't have godly wisdom is when we make it about us or we're jealous about somebody else. You see, when we, are, when we are jealous about somebody else, and, and I don't want you to think for a minute that I'm, I'm talking about jealous about their car, because that's one of them, but, but when we're jealous about somebody else, we do the whole, I wish I could do things the way they do. I wish I was as pretty as them. I wish I was as tall as them. I wish I was as strong as them. I wish I was as talented as them. I, I, I long to do things in a way that somebody else has the talent, thinking that my talent's not good enough, bitter jealousy, I'm jealous over what you have instead of what I have. And then selfish ambition. I can't tell you how many times I've heard someone say, but God wants me to be happy. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever thought that or ever said that, but I want to talk to you for a minute if you believe that God wants you to be happy. I'm going to ask you to find it in the Bible. I'll wait. If you can find a chapter and verse anywhere in Scripture where it says that God wants you to be happy, then I will stop right now. But nowhere in Scripture does it say God desires your happiness. No, God desires your praise. God desires your joy. God desires your fulfillment in life. But your happiness, not so much. Because your happiness is tied to something. Your happiness is tied to selfish ambition. Your happiness is tied to bitter jealousy. Your happiness says, I'll be happy when I get that thing that somebody else has. I'll be happy when I lose those 10 pounds. I'll be happy when I have that much money in my bank account. I'll be happy when I get that job promotion. I'll be happy when that person finally likes me. My happiness oftentimes is tied to a, a circumstance that is a constantly moving scale. God does not want your happiness. God wants your worship. God wants your obedience. God does not want your happiness. Now that sounds kind of conceited, and I will admit that if you think about it in the wrong perspective, God sure sounds like he is a very conceited individual. But let me explain to you why God wants your worship and your obedience more than your happiness. God wants your worship and your obedience more than your happiness because he knows your happiness will constantly change. But if he has your worship and he has your obedience, he also has provided you with the, full, the fulfillment of your joy. Think about it for a minute. The last time you had something really great happen in your life, like you, you got the, you, something really great happened, like you had a child or, or somebody, the, the, the guy finally asked you to marry him or you found out that you were pregnant or, or whatever it is. Like you had that moment, a really cool moment, right? That moment that brought a smile to your face and, and you just couldn't quit talking about it. When you had that realization, you began a moment of praise. Now, now not like singing hymns and songs in worship, but like you were kind of like, woo, yay, it happened. 
right? You got all kinds of excited, and you wanted to tell everybody about it. You studied hard. You passed the test. You got the graduation certificate, whatever it is. You're like, man, this is great. One chapter done. Moving on. See, when, when you begin down the journey of joy, joy is not fully accomplished until it turns into praise. And so God doesn't want your happiness. He wants your, he wants your worship and your obedience. He wants your worship and your obedience because when your life revolves around him, you'll find true joy, which doesn't stop when you've accomplished the thing. I'm going to pick on Maddie for just a minute. I didn't even ask her if I could do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And she gave me the thumbs up, so it's okay. When, when, when Maddie came and told me that, that she and, and Garrett were expecting a child, we, it was a great moment. She was super excited. She was like, yeah, this is the coolest thing ever. Just don't tell me, buddy. And so I kind of zipped my lip, and I didn't say a word. I didn't really tell anybody. She says, you can't tell your wife. So, so my wife's the only person I told, but I, I buttoned my lip, and I didn't say a word to anybody. And, and over time, as we were talking, she's, she keeps getting more and more excited about having a child. And she's like, this is the greatest thing. And she's like all kinds of giddy and everything. And it was, it was great. And then one day, we had an honest conversation. And I said, Maddie, your baby's going to grow up and be a lot like the kids you see in church like the kids in Sunday school, like the kids who talk back to their parents, like the teenager can't, who can't make right decisions. Your, your child is going to disobey, and that moment of what you think now is joy is going to be a fleeting moment of happiness because there are moments when you're going to go, what are you thinking? You see, if our, if our moments of, of happiness are all there is in life, we are going to be wanting later on. But if the source of our joy is our relationship with God, if God is the center of all that we do and everything we do revolves around him, there's no room for selfish ambition and there's no room for bitter jealousy. And so James keeps going and he's, he's speaking and he's teaching and he's telling us what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a person who loves Jesus and who follows Jesus? He says, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, if it's about you, if you are the God wants my happiness person, James has something to tell you in verse 15. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. And I know that hurts to hear, and I know that's something that's, that's probably uncomfortable, and inside of you something just kind of squiggles a little bit because you're like, yeah, but I, I think God does kind of want me to be happy. No. I mean, ultimately, you will find joy. But right now, perhaps the greatest thing God wants from you is to submit to his will so that you'll know joy because your happiness now will go away. See, he says this in verse 15. He continues on, or verse 16, uh, verse 15, I'm sorry, I was right. This is not wisdom that comes down from above. And then he tells us three things that that wisdom is. That wisdom does not come from God. That wisdom is not, is not uh, heavenly. It is, it is not of God. It is not godly wisdom. It is not wisdom really at all. But that wisdom, that, that thing that you're clinging to, is three things. And he says, he says it's earthly, it's unspiritual, and it's demonic. That wisdom, the wisdom that revolves around you, the wisdom that's all about you and your wishes and your desires and your happiness, that kind of wisdom, that kind of wisdom is earthly. Earthly. Now, when you hear the word earthly, you probably think like here, earthly. But that word is a word that means temporary. It means it's, it's here today and gone tomorrow, earthly. Everything upon this earth will, will rise up and it will fall. Everything that you acquire into your possession, every earthly, worldly thing will one day break down and it will one day need to be replaced. Every earthly thing will, will either break or perish or fade away. And so if you're basing all of your wisdom off of something that is about you, it is earthly, it is worldly, it is not good. Growing up in the church, I, uh, I, I heard for a long time growing up that our three enemies in, this, in, in our lives are the world, the devil, and the flesh. Now pay real close attention. The wisdom that is about you is worldly, unspiritual, read flesh, and demonic, read devil. 
Your three enemies, the three enemies that you and I have to wrestle with on a regular basis every single day are the world, the devil, and the flesh, and the sources of any wisdom that is not primarily focused on God at the center and his way being more than yours are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic, the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so James is saying, look, look, if your heart is not in the right space, if you are not putting everything through your relationship with God first and foremost, if you are not relying on him as the source of all that you do, your wisdom is not wisdom. It's earthly, it's worldly, it's temporary, it's unspiritual. It's unspiritual meaning that you are the determining factor of it. If your wisdom is about anything other than God, your wisdom is more about you than about serving and loving God. If you think God revolves around you and your happiness, you have basically replaced the God of the Bible with yourself. It is unspiritual. This is why Paul says over and over again, we must, sac we, we must, we must crucify the old Adam in us. We must, we must let that old selfish thing inside of us die so that Christ can come alive in us. The flesh must die so that the spirit might come alive again. You see, that wisdom that is not about God first and foremost and centrally, that wisdom is worldly, temporary. That wisdom is unspiritual and fleshly. And that wisdom is demonic. Now, the demons serve the devil. And the devil is known as the father of lies, right? So if you are having a wisdom that is based on demonic things, it is based on lies. And it means it's not truth, which means it's not wisdom, which means it's foolishness. How dare we call foolishness wisdom? If you've made all of this thing about the Bible and all of this thing about God, if you've made it about you, it's demonic. It's more of man than of God. And it's temporary, not eternal. But he doesn't stop there. He gets even, even more direct. He goes even farther with this. And he goes in verse 16. He says, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, he's going to take this to its logical conclusion. If you, if you value you more than God, if you are the center of your universe, if you are the center of your wisdom, this is what will happen. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Wisdom, if not finding its source in God, will lead to vile practice and chaos. In Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was chaotic and empty. And what did God do? The very first thing God did in creation was he began to order the chaos of a very chaotic creation and so when you and I rely on anything other than God, we are relying on our own chaos to get us through a very ordered life. Where selfish ambition, where jealousy exists, it will eventually, in time, morph and mutate into something that is vile and chaotic. And brokenness will exist. If you don't believe me, uh, let's just take a, let's take a look at your marriage, for instance. Those of you who are married, let me, let me tell you this. That if you really want to see what this looks like, if you really want to see the end result of what making it all about you looks like, I want you to go home. Don't do this, by the way. This is a really bad idea. So this is like, don't do this. But if you want to see how bad it gets, you go home and you make your life at home all about you. You make your spouse serve you all the time. You make your kids serve you all the time. You go to work and you make all of your employees bow down and worship you. Tell me how good that's going to go for you. Tell me how well. You, you walk home and you're like, honey, where's my food? This place revolves around me. The temperature's not right. The carpet lines are not perfect. Like, like if you vacuum the carpet, I vacuum in straight lines in the carpet. I'm weird. I get it. I'm weird. It's okay. Like, the carpet lines aren't straight when you vacuum. Like, really? If it's not done right. Would you please just do it right? Because it's about me, you know? Do you know how long I'd be able to live in my own house if I did that? I wouldn't even get the words out of my mouth. And my wife would be on the phone with my parents, and my parents would come drag my rear end out of my house. You see, that's the thing. When we make our lives all about us, we, we isolate ourselves from God's plan. 
And so if, if bitter jealousy and selfish ambition are your driving forces, it will become it will become divided. Discord will fall in. Relationships will spiral out of control. And eventually, you will give in to vile practice. Now, vile is a really disgusting word. A vile practice is something that you wouldn't even touch with your bare hands. I mean, a vile practice is something you don't, like, you see it and you're like, ooh, gross. Given its natural conclusion, Following a wisdom that is not from God will only lead to a life that you wouldn't even touch if you were in your right mind. And so James, getting real, being honest, continues. And this is one of my favorite things in Scripture. <clears throat> one of my favorite things in Scripture is when, when the Bible tells us, like, this is the bad thing. Like, this is how awful it is, how ugly it is, how terrifying it is. And then he throws this word in, but... This is like the roundabout that makes you go the opposite direction. This is the legal U-turn in your life. And he goes down, and he goes, so, so all these things, right? For, for where there's jealousy and selfish ambition, there is disorder and every vile practice, but, but, time to turn around, but, the wisdom from above. And he starts to describe what it looks like if you are actually practicing the wisdom from above. And he's describing a life where God is at the center and everything about you flows through everything about God. And he's describing a life where God is the, is the primary actor, where God is the one who orders creation. He's describing an existence where God knows more than you. He says, but the wisdom from above is first pure. There's no evil motives. There's no like little jabs, no get back at you. No, no, man, I wish somebody so-and-so was here to hear this. None of that, none of that. True wisdom is pure. Out of the purity of your heart, you long to be transformed by God. It's then peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Wisdom. When practiced rightly, when finding its source in God, looks like foolishness to the world. If we are truly wise, according to Scripture, the world will think we're not that smart. I mean, look at the cross. The ultimate picture of wisdom. And the world considers it folly, foolishness. The world thinks that it is the dumbest thing ever. That a God who has everything would give up his life for somebody who doesn't even really love him all that much. That's the power of true wisdom. Wisdom does the unthinkable. Wisdom crosses the uncrossable. Wisdom loves the unlovable. Wisdom seeks peace with those who want violence. Wisdom seeks restoration with those who seek division. This is what wisdom does when God is the center and when we realize his ways are not our ways, but his ways are so much better. We start to understand that the cross really was kind of foolish. But it was the most wise thing we ever could have experienced. So my challenge for you is this. As believers in Jesus, as people who claim to follow God, as those who want to be disciples, that you find your wisdom not in your accomplishments, not in selfish ambition, not in your quest for happiness. Please, you can be happy, but don't make that your life's goal. Your life's goal should be the fear and love of the Lord. Your life's goal, your, your end mark, your end zone line where you're trying to go, where, where that winning mark is, is, is not just the fear and love of the Lord, but it's the worship and obedience of what God has put in front of you. True wisdom it starts in the fear and love of the Lord, and it continues through praise and obedience to God's commands. If that's the wisdom that's in your heart, if that's the wisdom that drives your life, then you've experienced godly wisdom. But if you're wrestling in your heart about bitter jealousy or selfish ambition, understand and know, confess right now, repent, turn around, and realize that you need to walk away from those moments that are causing division and discord and disorder and vile practice and run into the loving arms of Jesus because he forgives you in those moments and he wants to restore you and demonstrate to you the 
picture of wisdom in its fullness, and that is that Christ loves you even when you don't love him back. And Christ died for you regardless of what you might believe. And Christ reaches out to you and snatches you out of the chaos of your own life and places you into the order of his perfected life. Just rely on him and the work he's done. That's wisdom. It starts and it ends in the truth of who God is. Can I pray with you? Gracious Father, we are so overcome with the realization of who you are and what you've promised us. We are overwhelmed by your love, by your forgiveness, by your grace and mercy. We don't understand it, and yet we sit here and we revel in its greatness. And so, Father, today I pray that you would grant us wisdom, grant us the ability to fear you and love you, and drive us to a place where we worship and praise you in all circumstances and where we are obedient to your every word that we might understand that the fullness of our joy is revealed in praise and honor of your name. And it's in that very name that we pray. Amen.